بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم إني أفتته السناء بهمدك وأنت مسدد للسواب بمنك وإقانت أنكارت رحم الراحمين في موزع العفة والرحمة وأشد المعاقبين في موزع النكال والنقمة وأعظم المتجبرين في موزع الكبرياء والعظمة اللهم أزنت لي في دعائك ومسألتك فاسمى يا سميع مدهتي واجب يا رحيم دعوتي وقن يا غفور أسرتي فكم يا إلهي من قربة قد فرجتها وهموم قد كشفتها وأسرة قد أقلتها ورحمة قد نشرتها والقتب لا قد فكتها الحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ صاحبة ولا ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره التكبير الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله بجميع محامده كلها على جميع نعمه كلها الحمد لله الذي لا مضاد له في ملكه ولا منازع له في أمره الحمد لله الذي لا شريك له في خلقه ولا شبيه له في عزمته الحمد لله الفاشي في الخلق أمره وحمده الظاهر بالكرم مجدو الباسط بالجود يده والذي لا تنقص خزائنه ولا تزيده كسرة عطاء إلا جودا وكرما إنه هو العزيز الوهاب اللهم إن أسألك قليلا من كثير ما هاجة ما هاجة بي إليه عزيما وغناك عنه قديم وهو عندي كثير وهو عليك سهل يسير اللهم إني عفك عن ذنبي وتجاوزك عن خطيئتي وصفك عن ظلمي وسترك على قبيل عملي وحلمك عن كثير جرمي إنما كان من خطئي وعمدي أطمعني في أن أسألك ما لا أستوجبه منك الذي رزقتني من رحمتك وأريتني من قدرتك وعرفتني من إجابتك فصرت أدوك آمنا وأسألك مستأنسا لا خائفا ولا وجلا مدلا عليك فيما قصدت فيه إليك فإن أبدع عني أتبت بجهل عليك ولعل الذي أبدع عني هو خير لي لعلمك بآقبة الأمور فلم أر مولا كريما أصبر على عبد لئيم منك علي يا رب إنك تدوني فأولي عنك وتتحبب إلي فأتبغز إليك وتتودد إلي فلا أقبل منك كأن لي التطول عليك فلم يعناك ذلك من الرحمة لي والإحسان إلي والتفضل علي بجودك وكرامك فارهم عبدك الجاهل وجد علي بفضل إحسانك إنك جواد كريم الحمد لله مالك الملك مجر الفلك مسخر الرياح فالك الإسماء ديان الدين رب العالمين الحمد لله على حلمه بعد غيرمه والحمد لله على عفه بعد قدرته 
والحمد لله على طول اناته في غضب وهو قادر على ما يريد الحمد لله خلا الحمد لله خالق الخلق باسط الرزق فالق الاسماء ذي الجلال والاكرام والفضل والعلام الذي بعد فلا يرى فقرب فشهد النجوى تبارك وتعالى الحمد لله الذي ليس له منازع يعادل ولا شبيه يشكل ولا زهير يعازد قهر بذات الاعز وتواضع لعظمته العظمى وبلغ بقدرته ما يشاء الحمد لله الذي يجيبني حين انادي ويستر علي كل عوره وانا عاصي ويعظم النعمه علي فلا اجازي فكم من موهبه هنيئه قد اعطاني وعزيمه مخوفه قد كفاني وباجه مؤنقه قد اراني فاثني عليك حامدا واذكره مسبحا الحمد لله الذي لا يفتك حجابه ولا يغلق بابه ولا يرد سائل ولا يخيب آمن الحمد لله الذي يؤمن الخائفين وينجي الصالحين ويرفع المستغفين ويزع المستكبرين ويهلك ملوكا ويستخلف آخرين الحمد لله قاسم الجبارين مبير الظالمين مدرك الهاربين نكال الظالمين سريخ المستسرخين موزع جات الطالبين معتمد المؤمنين الحمد لله الذي من خشيته ترعد السماء وسكانها وترجف الأرض وعمارها وتموج البحار ومن يسمع في غمراتها الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي يخلق ولم يخلق ويرزق ولا يرزق ويتعم ولا يتعم ويميت الأحياء ويحيي الموتى وهو حي لا يموت بيد الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير اللهم صل على محمد عبدك ورسولك وامينك وسفيك وحبيبك وخيرتك من خلقك وحافظ سرك ومبلغ رسالاتك افزل واحسن واجمل واكمل وأزكى وأنما وأطيب وأطهر وأسنى وأكثر ما صليت وباركت وترحمت وتحننت وسلمت على أحد من عبادك وأنبيائك ورسلك وصفتك وهل الكرامة عليك من خلقك اللهم وصل على علي أمير المؤمنين ووسيع رسول رب العالمين أبدك ووليك وأخي رسولك وهجتك على خلقك وآيتك الكبرى والنبي العظيم وصل على صديقة الطاهرة فاطمة سيدة النساء العالمين وصل على سبت الرحمة وإمام الهدى الحسن والحسن 
سيداي شباب أهل الجنة وصل على أمة المسلمين علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجافر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والخلف الهادي المهدي وجدك على عبادك وأمنائك في بلادك صلاة كثيرة دائمة اللهم وصل على علي ولي الأمرك القائم المعمل والعدل المنتظر وحفوا بملائكتك المقربين وأيدوا بروي القدس يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعل الداعي إلى كتابك والقائمة بدينك استخلفوا في الأرض كما استخلفت الذين من قبله مكله دينه والذي ارتزيته له أبد له من بعد خوفي أمنا يعبدك لا يشرك بك شيئا اللهم عز وعزز به وانصره وانتصر به وانصر نسرا نزيزا وافتح له فتحا يسيرا واجعل له من لدنك سلطانا نسيرا اللهم ذر بي دينك وسنة نبيك حتى لا يستخفي بشيء من الحق مخافة أحد من الخلق اللهم إنا نرغب إليك في دولة كريمة تعز بها الإسلام وأهله وتزل بها النفاق وأهله وتجعلنا فيها من الداة إلى طاعتك والقادة إلى سبيلك وترزقنا بها كرامة الدنيا والآخرة اللهم ما عرفتنا من الحق فهملنا وما قصرنا عنه فبلغنا اللهم المؤمن بي شعسنا واشعب بي صدعنا وارتق بي فتقنا وكسر بي قلتنا وعزز بي زلتنا واغربي آيلنا واقذبي عن مغرمنا واجبر بي فقرنا وسد بي خلتنا ويسر بي أسرنا وبيز به وجوهنا وفك بي أسرنا وأنجح بي طلبتنا وأنجز بي مواعيدنا واستجب بي دعوتنا وعتنا بي سؤلنا وبلغنا بي من الدنيا والآخرة آمالنا وعتنا بي فوق رغبتنا يا خير المسؤولين وأوسع المعاتين اشف بي صدورنا واذهب بي غيز قلوبنا واهدنا بي لما اختلف في من الحق بإذنك إنك تهدي من تشاء إلى صراط مستقيم وانصرنا بي على عدوك وعدوبنا إله الحق آمين 
Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As always, we are grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us the ability to fast. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of our prayers and fasting on this month, inshallah. Um, our last day of programs for 2024 Ramadan program will be this coming Monday. So two more nights we will be here, inshallah. And on Monday night, inshallah, we're going to have a similar workshop that we had prior to month of Ramadan, if you guys remember. Ajaga Mudara sat on the table, behind the table right there, and answered any questions uh, to, to cover the ahkam of Ramadan. It's going to be the same Q&A plus a workshop type of thing on Monday night. And inshallah, Ajaga Mudara will answer all of your questions. If you had any special circumstances, circumstances that you went through and you need more clarification, you can ask the question. And also Ajaga Mudara will cover how much we need to pay again for the Fitriya, which he elaborated last night a little bit, but it's going to be a little bit more broad coverage. And also, if you need to pay, what type of people need to pay Fidya, what type of people need to pay Kofara, um, all the difference between all of these, Ajah Mudaris will, inshallah, explain all of that on Monday night, inshallah. Uh, with that being said, uh, tonight I would like to recognize two brothers, uh, Ajah Mualim Hamkar and for beautiful recitation of dua after ta every night and other ziyadas and duas that they have recited throughout this month from the beginning. Uh, and also for the beautiful recitation of adhan every night that Haj Karim Bassam is uh, doing that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you guys ajr and tawad, inshallah. Uh, with that being said, uh, please see Brother Ziai Amili. Make sure that your monthly donations are paid. Uh, and if you can boost it up a little bit towards the end of the month, we would greatly appreciate your help. Um, and with that being said, I don't have anything more to cover. Uh, let's recognize uh, the sponsor of tonight's iftar for their own health and their family and for the soul of their marhumin. Please recite the salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. <laughs> Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. <coughs> if I can have everyone's attention, what happened? All of a sudden, they, everybody had their chai. I think the chai is kicking now. Everybody is waking up. Uh, yes, please. Um, the topic of tonight's speech is the continuation of previous nights, uh, which is Prophet Ibrahim, a one-man nation. And now I respectfully welcome Ajara Mudaris to podium for the speech. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
final days of the month of Ramadan. And as we, I would say, two weeks ago almost, I mentioned that most likely over 95% chance Wednesday will be the Eid al, Eid al fitr based on the almost uh, zero uh, chance of possibility, zero percent of chance of possibility of sighting of the moon on Monday night and also very high chance of visibility on Tuesday night because <clears throat> it should be visible across U.S. For that, uh, it's not that, again, we change the rules of moon sighting. It's just the way the position of the moon and the position of the uh, visibility curve it is, it just helped us this year to be able to know exactly when the Eid will be. And as I said, most likely will be on Wednesday, April 10th. So it means we have uh, three uh, more days of programming, uh, two more days of programming, three more days of fasting. And Ramadan, with all its blessing, is leaving us, and as we have in the word of Prophet, in the word of Imam al-Sajjad, they have these du'as, wida' shahr Ramadan, farewell to the month of Ramadan. And in those words, we see expression of sadness that with the completion of Ramadan, many blessings of this Ramadan also finishes. Uh, but at the same time, with Eid is coming closer, we are grateful, we are happy and blessed that we were able to spend another month of Ramadan with health if you were able to fast. If not, at least we were able to benefit from the nights, from the days of the month of Ramadan and Quran recitation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a fast that is maqbul, is accepted, and inshallah, a day of Eid, that as I mentioned last night, inshallah, is a day of freedom for us, a new beginning for us, inshallah, a new a clean slate for a new beginning, that we, uh, inshallah, take advantage of the uh, remainder of our lives to, to do good, to be our best, and to be sincere servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the follower of the Prophet and the Quran and his family, Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa salam, with another salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. As Haji Farzad mentioned, uh, I was planning to finish the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam by tomorrow. So tonight we're going to go uh, one step further, and then tomorrow night we will complete the series. And and then on Monday, which is the last night of our program, my plan was to have Q&A because I received many questions on the Slido. But also, uh, Haj Farzad, may Allah, again, he thanks everyone. We should also thank Brother Haj Farzad Zarabi for his work, not missing a night, being here on time, doing his part. May Allah, inshallah, give him the khair of dunya and akhirah and bless him and his family. He suggested let's do a similar workshop for the Eid al-Fit on Monday so that would we save time because last night I started talking about the rules of fasting and some questions start coming and he said maybe that's a better idea. So that's the benefit of consultation. That's why suggestions also are important. So inshallah on Monday we will have Q&A as well as inshallah talking about Eid al-Fit, Zakat al-Fit, Fitriya, Kafara, Fidya, all of those, inshallah, on Monday night. Uh, for the well-being of everyone who volunteer, help, they participate in the majalis. For all those who participated from the first night of Ramadan till the last night of our program, those who come here, and they can be home, they can be you know, watching TV and just spend the time that way, but they choose to come and perform jama'a prayers, listen to dua, listen to speech. These are uh, blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that help us, invited us to come to his house and to spend the night this way. Let's recite a salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. یک نفر چون فارسی پرسید من میگم دوشنبه بازم ما بیشتر توضیح میدیم مسائل زکات فقط پرسیدن کسایی که مریضن کسایی که مریضن مثل هر سال دیگر بعد فهم میگم بعضی از قوانین ما چند بار گفتیم ولی بعضیا شاید بگم حواسنا نبوده ای است که میزان و مقدار 
زکات فطریه سه کیلوگرم است که میشه 6 پوند و نیم بیشترش 6 پوند 6.7 پوند ولی فت... ولی فدیه یا کفاره کسی که بیمار است مریض است فدیه سالانه مثلا 750 گرم قزاس برای هر روزی یک کسی که مریض است برای تعداد روزایی که نمیتواند روزه بگیرد و بعدا هم قضا نمیتواند بکنند 750 گرم قضا حالا یا نان یا برنج یا هر چیزی حالا چه مقدار میشود 750 گرم من میگم حداقل در جایی که ما زندگی میکنیم 3 دلار منموم 3 دلار برای هر روزه چون 750 گرم میشه تقریبا یک وعده قضا و الان هم با این انفلیشنی که هست همین 3 دلار شما می توانید تقریبا 750 گرم شه تقریبا 3 پوند. بس اگه چی بخرین همون 3 دلار روزی. از اگه مثلا 30 روز بوده باشد می شود چقدر؟ 90 دلار. 90 دلار میشه کلا ما رو بزن. ولی یه چیزی که مهم است فدیه سال بعد واجب میشه. فدیه الان شما روزه نتوانستین بگیرین خب روز عید نمیتونین فدیه امسال بدین. چون بعد بگذاریم یک سال بگذره که نتوانیم قضاییش رو بگیریم رمضان سال بعد که میاد تازه واجب میشه میگه خب شما مرزی شما دائم بود از این رمضان تا رمضان بعد ادامه داشت الان بر شما فدیه واجب است او وقت میپردازه اگر کسی پرداخته است میتونه بگه خب اونایی که پرداختیم برای سال قبلتر بوده اونایی که پرداختیم برای سال قبلتر بوده فدیه امسال زود نپردازیم فدیه پارسال را اگر میخوایید الان میتوانید بپردازید بفرمایید بله زمان واجب شدنش همون موقع بله زمانش اون موقع واجب میشه بله یعنی میگه وقت داره دیگه مثل نماز وقتش که واجب میشه شما نماز میخوانید فدیه شما هم کی واجب میشه رمضان سال بعد که میگه مرضی ادامه پیدا کرد تا رمضان سال بعد و خود فطریه رو هم اگر کسی فطریه خودش رو قبل از ماه رمضان داده باشد کافی نیست اگر کسی به فقیر کمک کرده قبل از ماه رمضان به عنوان زکات فطر حساب نمی شود در ماه رمضان درست است و خب مسلما در شب عید و روز عید هم درست است ولی اگر کسی قبل از ماه رمضان زکات فطر داده باشد یا به نیت زکات فطر داده باشد کافی نیست یک راه حل دارد که الان هم نمیشه کرد چون اگه دادین انشالله خداوند قبول کند از شما یه از که انسان اگه مثلا میگه ما میخوایم یه بنده خدا نیاز دارد ماه رمضان مثلا نیازمند است ما میخوایم زکات فطره رو بهش بدیم قرض میدید قرض میدیم به این شخص و وقتی که رمضان شروع شد یا عید فتر که آمد او قرض رو شما به عنوان فطری میبخشید او وقت این کار رو میشود کرد بگه صرف اگه بگیم زکات فطر است نمیشه. شالا گفتم همونجور که حاجی فرزاد گفت سوالا بسیار زیاد است دوشنبه شب عمری اگر باشد انشالله در خدمت شما خواهیم بود با سوال شما so if you have any question about zakat al-fit fitri fidya we will cover that on Monday night انشالله لرسه سهر نال صلوات علی محمد و آل محمد خیر خیر بدون اجازه نمی شود خیر نه سهم ما باید اجازه داشته باشن ما اجازه می گیریم با اجازه استفاده می کنیم این که صرف ای که اول بیارم به جای سهم ما حساب کنن خیر نمی شود نه بله بله اگر اجازه داده باشن به شما وسیله بخرین می توانید اگر بله 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 متوجه بله 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 اگر اون مسجد اجازه گرفته گفتم دیگه اجازه گرفته اجازه گرفته بله میتونیم ولی که سوالی نه است که یک نفر مال میاره میگه ما با سهم امام این مال خریدم به مسجد او دیگه نمیشه او بعد بده به اون جایی که اجازه داره در جایی که خود اونا تصمیم میگیرن استفاده کنن من نمیتونم برنج بیارم بگم این سهم امام 
منظور است بله بله جایی که اجازه دارد می شود بله اوکی انا صلوات علی محمد و علی محمد خوب شد که من مندی نگفتم اوکی اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلاق اجمعین باعث الانبیاء والمرسلین ثم الصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء حبیب الله العالمین بالقاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى اهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين سيما بقية الله في السماوات والأرضين قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن الكريم واذكر في الكتاب إسماعيل إنه كان صادق الوعد وكان رسولا نبيا صدق الله العلي العظيم May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enlighten our hearts by the light of iman and guidance and help us to cleanse our soul from corruption, from deviance and misguidance by the light of Qur'an and the prophets and his family with another salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. <laughs> Ibrahim alayhi salam brought his wife Hajar and his newborn son Ismail to a land that now we know it as the city of Mecca. And we have that Hajar looks at Ibrahim as he is commanded to leave his child and his wife and trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And she says these words, Ila man takiluni. Who are you leaving, leaving me with? And Ibrahim assures her that the same God who protected him through, throughout his life. He is watching after them. He is the one whose power brought us to existence. He is the one who appointed messengers and prophets of God. The same one will watch after you and our kid and our son. And we have that Hajar, the moment of desperation, she's in search of water, running from one mountain to another. Now we know those mountains as the mountains of Safa and Marwa, seven times running between these two. And eventually, the burst of the spring of Zamzam. Zamzam was not a, ch- was not a well. It became a well later on, when they dug a well next to it in order to access water. And even till this day, Zamzam is a source of life and at the same time blessing for the people who go and perform Hajj. And Ismail and his mother, they lived next to this spring and later on what is known to be the house of God until both of them eventually witness that there is a tribe moving in with them and now they're going to experience this city now has life has people to the point of their death they live in this city and eventually they were buried next to Kaaba what is known as Hijr Ismail as this short wall half circle wall around the house of God which is known as Hijr Ismail And I think that was the point that we kind of ended, that Ibrahim Alisson went through another test. And this test was to leave his child and his wife in Mecca. And now it comes the moment that Ibrahim Alisson is going back and forth between Palestine, Syria, and Mecca. He's going back and forth. He's not living with Ismail and Hajar all the time. He's visiting, he's there, and then he goes. Because later on we know that Allah gave him another son, Ishaq, from his wife Sarah. And Ishaq and Sarah, they're living in Palestine, that area. 
And in one of these journeys that when he comes to Mecca, all the way in Hijaz, we have that he sees this dream that he says to his son, فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ مَعَهُ السَّعِي when he was old enough to assist in his endeavor. Now Ismail, we can say he's a teenager. There are some numbers like he was 13. He's now at the age that can stand by his father's side and can help him. He said to his son, my son, I see in dreams that I am sacrificing you. Another test coming on the way of Ibrahim. If Ibrahim, once again, he has all these titles, this lofty status of being the father of these Abrahamic religion as we know. Ibrahim did not get them as a coincidence, as luck or chance helping him in this journey. Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, but also is his efforts, his struggle, his sacrifice that made Ibrahim alayhi salam to be the father of the prophets, Shaykh al aimma If other prophets of God went through one or two or three tests, Ibrahim alayhi salam, we see one after another is going through bala, bala meaning test, trials. And he says to his son, to Ismail, that I had a dream. I'm translating it as I had. But the word that Quran says is, Inni ara fil manam. I see in my dreams, not that I saw. It doesn't use a past tense. It uses a present tense, as if this is something that is happening, is clear, is not something that he is doubting. Is not something that has is open to interpretation. His dream is vivid. His dream is crystal clear. It's not like our dreams. Our dreams, which we will like I get to the dreams in a few minutes, are a different world. But Ibrahim Alayhi said, Inni ara fil manam. I see in dreams that I am sacrificing you. Fandur Mada Tara. See what you think. What's your, what's your idea, my son? What do you think about this? And that's now we see that if Allah chose Ismail to be the next prophet of God, and he's going to be the great, great grandfather ultimately on the family tree of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ismail also has his own strong faith and dedication and devotion. Because as a young man, this is what Ismail says to his father. Once his father says, what do you think? He says, قَالَ يَا أَبَتِفْ عَلْمَا تُؤْمَرْ He says, father, do whatever you have been commanded. Listen to Allah and what he has told you to do. ستجدني إن شاء الله من الصابرين. If Allah wishes, you will find me to be patient. You will find me. I'm not someone who complain. I will be patient. This is from all Surah Safat, verse 102. Few lessons again, like everything else. I don't like to just say a story and just move on. I want to think and reflect and encourage you to do the same. The first one is the role of dreams in our lives. Ru'ya. Sleep without a doubt is one of the most important experiences of humanity. Till this day, there are multiple theories about why human beings sleep. No one with all these studies that have been done about sleep can for sure and definitely tell us that this is what the sleep is or what dreams are. There are theories. There's one that says, you know, this is the way our, bri our brain categorizing information. 
This is the fragmentation, like a, a computer that's something you see there are different pieces of data. You try to defrag it and kind of uh, combine the information. This is one theory. Another one said that this is, goes back to our biology and is the need of our body to go through resting. But no one can actually say this process of dreaming. And we have in our narration that dreams are a gateway to the world that is mujarrat, immaterial world. And there are fascinating thing, fascinating thing about it, and maybe inshallah in the future I, I put it in my notes that maybe we can have a multiple, like it cannot be in one lecture, multiple lectures on the importance of dreams and the role of them in our religion and how should we look at it and the purpose of it. But right now, just for the sake of this story, I want us to just know that this experience that many of us have, or almost all of us have, is not something that we can just move on quickly from it. That in dreams we see how we experience things without physically being there. Our body is being the same place, but we are traveling distances in our dreams. Even the passage of time, when people ask us, you know, day of judgment, they said it's going to be a long day, it's going to be thousands of hours, it's, or they say that the time in Barzakh, the way it is passing is very different from the world. For example, we have an hour in Barzakh, our years in this life. So how is that? It doesn't make any sense. And the answer to that is that Barzakh is not a place, this barrier, this middle world, is not a place that is dictated by the law of physics. By the law of physics, we have, you know, this, all these theories, the rel relativity and all the concept of the gra gravity and the passage of time, uh, time and space in interacting with each other. And then we have the passage of time as we know and perceive it the way we do. You know even gravity affects time, right? That if you go, we go to the Mars, it will be different, the passage of time that it is right now here. So when you put that in the concept of Barzakh, Barzakh is not a material world in this sense. There is no sun, there is no moon the way we have it here. There is no bodies and cells the way we go through. But how can we actually get a glimpse of how it is? And one example of that, a sample of that is our dream and sleep. I don't know if it happened to you, but it happened to many, that you try to take a nap for 20 minutes, for 30 minutes, or you sleep for a short amount of time, an hour, and then you have a full-on dream experience. It's 20 minutes dream, it's one hour dream, but you have one of those dreams that goes from A to Z, the whole experience. And when you wake up, you cannot believe it that it has only been one hour or 30 minutes or 20 minutes. As if in the dream, the time, the way it moves is very different. Or the other way around, you go and sleep, and you've been asleep for six hours, right? Especially in month of Ramadan, right? Especially after Laylatul Khan. You try to take it, you know, you try to sleep. And you wake up, and it's such a short experience. And you think, okay, it's been just 20 minutes or at maximum one hour. So it's already been five hours. The passage of time is different. And that's only still an experience that we go through this body. The soul interact with this body. Again, I don't want it to make it overcomplicated, but dreams are, could be a, a sign that lead us that reality and what we consider to be reality is very complicated. And Ibrahim salam, he doesn't say, I had a dream, I saw something. He said, I see a dream. When you talk about past tense, you talk based on your memory, you can make mistakes is open to interpretation, context, emotions, feeling. But when he said, I see, he said, this is no doubt in my mind, this is from Allah. That's why any narration that doesn't approve this Quranic narrative, we do not accept. That said, oh, you know, shaitan made Ibrahim to see this dream. No. This is directly from Allah, and Ibrahim is clear to him. Just know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses dream to communicate with his prophets 
as a very rare method of communication. Rarely Allah uses it, but when it uses it, Allah make the dream to be vivid, clear, not open to interpretation, is very straightforward. You see the reality. And that's the way a prophet of God experiences dream. But the entire Quran, as again, there are people who try to claim that Quran was dreams of prophet. We do not believe in that. Revelations are received by Allah, by the messenger of Allah, by prophet directly from Jibra'il. And dreams are again, once in a while we see as, an, as a sample, again, somewhere I heard this number, that 170th, 170th of the time that Allah uses communication, uses dream. The rest of the 69 part out of 70 is going to be direct. You're awake, you're aware, and Allah communicate with you. So it's not like that the prophet of God said, okay, let, give me time, let me go to sleep, and then I bring you a message. No. Prophet of God will receive revelation, majority of it, almost all of it, except few instances, in broad daylight and when he's awake. But in this case, Ibrahim a.s. received in a dream. Lesson number one, so that the dreams are complicated, but at the same time are very important part of our connection with the barzakh or for the other realm. Second one is that Ibrahim a.s. did not have any doubt about his dream. His dream did not need any interpretation. That's why he uses the word ara, I see it, I see it. It's as if it's happening before me, right? And then the third point is that not to get confused and do not compare our dreams with the dream of Ibrahim. This is where the danger is. This is where the importance of afala yatadabbaroon al-Qur'an, the reflection on the Qur'an comes. We should be mindful of this danger of somebody reading Qur'an and said, you know, I should do this. Ibrahim a.s. had a dream, I saw a dream, I should do something according to my dream. Based on what I know and my experiences, most likely someone will see that, oh, in my dream I have to do something to Shaykh Madaris. <laughs> Please, do not confuse a story of Ibrahim with yourself. Why is that? Number one, a prophet of God doesn't have any filter, a spiritual filter to receive a divine message. Right? There is no. Prophet of God, see it for what it is. The way we see dreams are covered with hijab. Veils after veils after veils. That's why we have this concept of ta'abir or interpretation, that the dreams are not as they seem. They have these different layers that you have to go through in order to get to the heart. And that is for the non-profits, for the average people. That's why dreams should not be a source of, of action. I want to be clear what I'm saying. Dreams could be a sign. Dreams could play in a form of warnings. We have multiple of our scholars, including Allama Taba Tabai, may Allah bless his soul, talk about dreams. He said there are dreams that they are clear, vivid. There are the second type of dream that they are, these call them non-vivid. Dreams that they are open to interpretation. They have messages, but they are covered convoluted kind of. And then there are a third type of dream they call adhghath or ahlam. There are dreams that they are influenced by our surrounding, by our emotions. Let's say you had too much food and you sleep and you see something. That dream, you see you had, you know, especially in Ramadan, some people say, Shaykh, what's interpretation? What was your dream? You know, you see, I was in a chocolate factory and I was eating chocolate and all this. So you've been thinking too much about chocolate. That's it. What do you want? What kind of interpretation? You were thinking about this, that's what happened. You think about having, I don't know, a car. All you care about, you've been obsessed for the past month about buying a car. You see that you have your dream car and you're driving it. Again, most likely is effect of your emotions, your ambitions, your desires. And Quran referred to that as adhghath or ahlam. The type of dreams that they have no meaning, but they're a reflection of our desires. So there are three types of dreams. The first type, vivid dreams are coming for Prophet of Allah, for Awliya Allah. 
They have a dream, and the dream has a meaning, straightforward. And we do not have an access to that, and we should not confuse ourselves. That's why, if you ask any of our maraji, any of our scholars, that if somebody had a dream, and in a dream they're being told, a clear voice tells them to do this. If what you're listening and hearing is telling you to do something that you're not supposed to, you ignore it. Oh, I had a dream that this Ramadan, I should not fast. It was very clear. Five times I saw it. Allah said, you know what? You're such a good person. Take a break. You ignore that one. And you fast. And you ask Allah to forgive you that why you see such a dream. I don't know why. Or any other kind of dream in that line. I saw in my dream that I should stop talking to my brother, to my mom. The dream was clear. Again, if a dream tells you to do something that is wrong, even if that action is makruh, forget about haram. If you see a dream that I should drink, ignore that dream. You don't need a dream. A prophet of God came, Quran came to tell you that this is haram. Do you think that suddenly a prophet's work and Quran and all this is going to go aside because of your dream? No. The priority goes to him. Jazakallah. The priority goes to him, to the teaching, to the concrete message. And dreams are not going to be important. You don't give priority to. I say it because culture to culture, family to family is very different. Some people, all their lives is based on dreams. They're dream walkers. That's what they do. Why are you doing this? I had a dream. Why you behave this way? I had a dream. So a dream, even if it tells you to do something makru, let me tell you, what is makru? Makru is an action that is not a sin. But in our teachings of our faith, it's been said that we are discouraged to do it. It's not haram, it's not forbidden, you're not going to be punished for it, but it's better to stay away from it. It's better to stay from it. An example of, for example, karaha is makru, is makru to overeat, is makru to eat to the point that you can say, you know, I, I cannot even have another bite. I'm going to explode. Is makru to eat to that degree? Is karaha. So in my dream, I had a dream that when you go to this house, eat to the point that you're going to just, you know, have no more room. It doesn't matter. That action is makru, you stay away from it. Another example of karaha, you know, there, there's a long list of things that we can say that is makru, uh, but we can think about in month of Ramadan. If people are waiting, they're breaking their fast, and you're doing your prayers, it's makru to stall, to prolong your prayers while others are waiting. Is mustahab, if the sufra, if the spread is already ready, is recommended to break your fast first and then do your salat. But if it's no, if the food is not ready, it's must have to do your salat first, then you do it. It's makru to prolong it unnecessarily when others are waiting. These are makru. Is it haram? No, it's not haram. But it's discouraged. Or is sleeping. Or the rules of sleeping, there's karaha, there's makru to do certain things when you sleep, in what direction you sleep, there are makru mustahab. If you had a dream that is against the commands of Allah, you ignore that dream. Even if in your mind it's very straight, it's very clear. And I had examples of that. I have examples of that. That someone said, I'm not doing a wajib because I had a dream that I shouldn't. And then it comes to the second one. Most of our dreams are signs. You did something wrong and you know you did it. And a dream comes and warns you. It reminds you that you know, you need to make up for that. You need to apologize for that. You need to repent for that. Alhamdulillah, very straightforward. Everything works together. It's compatible. I did something wrong. And now I, there's a sign. I see a dream that I'm in trouble, that I feel that you know I'm in agony and pain, and when I wake up, is a reminder, okay, do something about this. Before it's too late, let me go and make up for it. 
That's fine. It's a sign from Allah. But dreams are personal. You cannot have a dream for someone else. Do not take the extreme that far. Again, I've had people of cases. They come and they said, you know, I had a dream. You should, you should donate $500. Why? There is something bad is coming your way. I had a dream. You should. This is not a way. You can say, okay, I recommend you to donate. I, recommend, I advise you to give sadaqa. That's good. But to say, because of my dream, you should do it. Now you're becoming a self-claimed prophet in your own way, a mini prophet that I'm telling people what to do now. There's one thing to advise people, another thing said, I'm giving you your responsibility based on my dreams. So our dream doesn't oblige people either. Because I had a dream, somebody else has to do something. An example, true story. True story. Somebody came and talked to this family who had a daughter. And this family was coming, have a son. So you know, I had a dream that your daughter must marry my son. And if not, whoever else she marries, she will be in trouble. And they came to me and this poor woman was crying. I said, Sheikh, I don't know if my girl is going to be okay with this. My daughter is going to be okay with this. And she says this and she's very confident. And she also recites dua and Quran. She's also from this family who are religious. What if what she says is true? And I told her, I said, sister, she doesn't have a authority over Allah. She doesn't. In the history of Islam, you never see a case that, oh, you should marry this person because I tell you. Even a prophet of God goes to Fatima to Zara and said, my daughter Fatima, do you want to marry? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Do you want to marry Ali? Because there were other people who came forward. Do you think she is above the family of the Prophet that they are going to decide? So be aware of this. There's unfortunate abuse. As important and as a magnificent, fascinating world dreams are, some people abuse it. So dreams are not going to oblige other people either. Oh, you have to do something because of my dream. Your dreams are for you, my brother, my sister. It's for you. And if you have a good dream, keep it to yourself. Do not use dreams as a selling point for your faith either. Oh, alhamdulillah, last night I saw this masoom in my dream. And the other week I saw this. Please keep it to yourself. These are between Allah. Yes, sometimes you say it as a sign. That you know, brother, you know, sister, you're in trouble. Let me tell you. I'm not going to tell you too much. But there are moments that you see these signs that Allah sent you. And it happened to me. And those signs help me to figure out. That's fine. But another one, you just want to indirectly say, you know, I'm a good one. I'm a good person and you're not. This is a different world. Ibrahim, alayhi salam, his dream is the first type. Vivid dream, no need interpretation. Second dream... Needs interpretation. Example of that in the Quran is the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. You see that Yusuf alayhi salam, when two of his cellmates or jailmates, they come and they ask Yusuf alayhi salam to interpret his dream, their dreams for them. That one of them said, I had a dream that birds are eating from my head. And the other one said, I, 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 I had this another dream. And then later on, uh, Yusuf alayhi salam given the interpretation that said, unfortunately, one of you, you will not survive this. And another one, you will survive this and you will be carrying food and you will serve the king. And eventually it happened. And that interpretation become a kind of an op opening for the king when he saw the dream. That there are seven cows or, or beasts that they are eating the other seven thin one. And when he had a dream, his advisor were not able to understand it. Then that jailmate now is free and serving the king. He said, oh, somebody's in prison who did my dream and my jailmate's dream. And he's actually the real deal. 
whatever he said it did happen. And that's the way kind of Yusuf السلام, comes and give the interpretation of the seven year of blessings and then continued accompanied by seven years of famine and drought and kind of prepared them. And then brought, and Yusuf comes to a position of being the advisor and in charge, the administrator of Egypt. So here we see that that dream is not as straightforward, a bird eating from over his head. And that becomes an interpretation of death. But who has that knowledge? Yusuf alayhi That Allah said, we are the one who gave him the knowledge of ta'abir, the, the, the knowledge of interpretation. And that's not for everyone either again. Many dreams that people talk about have no interpretation. No interpretation. Majority of them, as far as I can say, based on my experiences. And then there's a third type, which, as I said, the dreams that are a reflection of our desires. Our deen not, should not be based on dreams. Our religion should not be based on dreams. Our deen should be based on, number one, Quran. Number two, prophets, teaching. And number three, which is the completion of these two, this bridge between the two, is the Ahlul Bayt, family of the Prophet. These are the ones. These are the sources. Anything else is not even secondary. It should be considered the last point of significance. Prophet and Ahlul Bayt, Quran. Kitab Allah wa Aitrati Ahlul Bayt. These are the two. That's where you get your deen from. That's it. That's why I try to stay away from talking about people's dreams. And there are people who say it, good for them. They know better. They're knowledgeable as well. And the member, they said, oh, this person had this dream and that person has it. Good for them. I try to not to do it as much. Because then people assume, some, this is people's interpretation, that, oh, okay, dreams, I can have dreams as well. I said all this not to be confused. When you listen to the story of Ibrahim, do not assume that I can be Ibrahim. Because Ibrahim was asked to sacrifice his son. If I, in my dream I saw something, I saw in my dream that I have to smash this window. Please don't. This is not going to be the same story. For you and us, we have so many filters. We have shaitan, we have our ego, we have our desires. It's not a clear message. And you say, okay, so if there is no message, what should I do? If it's a confusing message, what are you going to do? Do what anyone who's traveling does. Let's say if you're traveling and you have a map. And there's some missed signal comes. And you said, oh, it could be here, it could be here. But they're not clear. What are you going to do? You're going to stick to the one that you have. Because the other ones are not clear. When we have our deen teaching of our deen telling us how to live. If something comes on, on our way that is not clear, stick to what is clear. That's how it should be. Anything that you don't have any knowledge, stay away from. What you have certainty, follow that. Rather than sticking to mutashabihad, to metaphorical, the matters that could have multiple interpretation, stick to the definitive muhkamat sometimes. So, Ibrahim, when he sees this dream, he talks to his son. He doesn't say, my son, let's go, without telling him, without informing him. He said, my son, this is it. What do you think we should do? This is a message for fathers and mothers and their relationship with their kids, communication and talking to them. When you want to make a decision, especially when a, a man, as Quran said, when he come to that age, then now we can assist, meaning he's not a child anymore. When child, a, a child meaning usually under the teen's age, under 12, 13 usually. A child is not at the age you ask a seven-year-old, is not it. My son, my daughter, what do you think? Do you, do you think you should watch more TV or not? So you know the type of parenting I utilize is a modern way of it. I'm friend with my son. I'm friend with my daughter. And my du'as is, may Allah have mercy on both of you. Because to be friend is one thing, to be friendly is another thing. Yes, your friend should not be, your, your son or daughter should not be scared of you, 
horrified by you. But at the same time, they should know as a father, as a mother, at that age, you are in charge. You're the authority. My son, sleeping time. No more phone. You're eight years old. You should act like eight years old. When I see eight years old who act like teenagers, I'm scared. And this is happening in our society. I see children who some of them are growing up too fast in some elements. Social media, the things that they're exposing our kids to, they know things that many of us, and again, I'm including myself, millennials and Gen Z and all these labels put aside. In my time, there were things that I didn't know about until I was 13, 14, 15. Now seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds knows about them because of social media. And it's not just a matter of physical and it's not about desire. No, it's other things. For example, an eight-year-old, why an eight-year-old should think about fame? Why? Why an eight-year-old should want to be famous? Influencer, why? It did not exist it. A few decades ago, eight-year-olds were eight years old. They were playing, they were running around, they were wrestling. And now at the eight, you know, I want to be famous. I want people to know me. I want to give signatures. Something changed. And you see, they are, in some elements, they're growing too fast. They know more than their age. In other aspects, they're behind. You see a 23-year-old who still act like a child. His mom should be the one picking up after him at the age of 20. The girl, 18, 19, still act like a 10-year-old. In some elements, they're already too far ahead, and that's, this is where the crisis happens. This is where the confusion is. You're a man-child, and you're an unnecessarily grown-up person at the same time. Because depending on what aspect we would talk about, And Ibrahim has that lesson, Ibrahim al -Islam. Talk to your children, especially when it comes to that age. When they're children, your children should have a proper environment. This is the word of the Prophet. I said this hadith before. Prophet said, your, eight, your, your children, these are not wajib. Again, do not take this hadith as, a, okay, this is it, this is obligation. This is a Prophet's advice. He said, your children from the age, the moment they're born up to the age seven, your childs are your masters. Amir. Meaning that the child from the age that they are born, from the one-year-old, or one-day-old, to the seven-year-old, this is a time for them to be a child. You cannot tell them what to do. You cannot force them to learn. You cannot discipline them. A three-year-old, you cannot discipline them. When they cry, they cry. You should be the one managing them. You cannot hit a child at the age four and say, stop crying. You should figure out why they're crying. They're not at the age to communicate with you. From the moment they're born to the age seven, your child, he's in charge, kind of. She is in charge. It's a time for them to develop. This is a time for them to play. This is a time for them to have that kind of time for imagination, freedom. You don't let them hurt themselves. You watch over them not to fall in, you know, get into trouble. But at the same time, you do not put them in one class after another, after another. As I've seen it, four-year-olds who are been to one class to another to another because the parents feels, I want my son to be successful. I want my daughter to be successful. And then overwork them at that age. They should play. Not all the time, but they should have playing time. Even education should be in the form of play. And then Prophet said, from seven to 14, your child should be like your apprentice, your employee means that you're in charge. You tell them what to do. From 7 to 14 is a time of discipline. Go to bed this time. Not, that you would, not to be you know, cruel with them and harsh with them. No, be kind to them. Say, my son, go to bed. It's a time of sleep. No more phone at this time. No more TV, more than this amount. Have instructions. Not just instruction, but have instruction. That's 7 to 14. And then from 14 and above, your child becomes your advisor, wazir. You start putting based on their ability. And 14 years, old, 14 years old are not the same. 
Not the same. Please stop comparing your 14-year-old with another 14-year-old. Some of them don't have the physical endurance to do certain things. Some of them may have. So based on the ability of your child at the age of 14, then your child is your wazir. And I said, what is a wazir? Come from wizr. Wizr means burden. Wazir means somebody who carries the burden of the king. That's what the wazir is, means, advisor. And your child, you start putting a bit of weight on their shoulder, meaning you give them responsibility, slowly. Not you ask your 14-year-old suddenly to do everything in the house, slowly. I look at your body, I see you can carry this from point A to point B, carry it. But if I see that you cannot do it, I'm going to say, okay, Sheikh Mudarra said, or the hadith said, from the age 14, you start carrying the burden. That's the wisdom. That's, we should stop taking a word and say, okay, I'm going to just follow this as it is. Our prayers, we should do it as it is. That's a wajib matter. Everything else in a matter of interaction, in a matter of dealing with people, it should be customized. It should be modified. And that's why the rules of Allah are not the same for every single person when it comes to certain matters. A marid, a sick person, doesn't fast. A faqir, a poor person who cannot pay for the expenses of their family, they don't have any job, they don't pay zakat al-fitr. Islam is not a... Okay, you should just give zakat al-fitr. I don't care how you make it, how, where you get it from, just get it. No. Can you afford zakat al-fitr? Pay. You cannot afford it, you're a faqir, you don't pay. Nothing on you. Same is with your child. And Ibrahim al-Islam talked to his son. He said, my son... I had in my dream. You're at this age that you should carry this burden with me. This is not just about me. It's about sacrificing you. I love you the most. But this is your life that we're talking. What do you think? And then Ismail said, do my, my father, ya abate. It's a word of con uh, compassion, kindness. My father, abate fa'al ma tu'mar. Do what Allah told you to do. I'll be patient. And then Quran continues, and I'm going to inshallah finish with this, these ayat. He says, فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَ وَتَلَّهُ لِلْجَبِينَ So the day came. This is the day of Eid al-Adha, Eid al-Qurban. So when they had both surrendered to Allah's will, both submitted, and Allah doesn't say Ibrahim did, أَسْلَمَا Ibrahim did and Ismail, both they surrendered. Because this is not just Ibrahim's work, this is sacrificing Ismail. He has a say in this. And our deem is haram for a father to say, you know, I'm going to just marry my daughter to someone. It's not your call. You're a father, you're a wali, you're a guardian. But also, she has the one that should consent to it or not. Both have to have that consent when it comes to daughters. When both Ibrahim and Ismail surrendered, and he had laid him down on his forehead. We called out to him, O Ibrahim, you have indeed fulfilled your vision. This is when Ibrahim takes his son to Qurban or to make it an offering. This is not in the Quran, but it's in the Hadith, in the historical reports. That on the way to sacrifice Ismail, Shaitan came to distract Ibrahim. We have that he came and he wanted to say that why you're doing this, you've been so old that Allah gave you this, maybe this is not it. And we have that Ibrahim alayhi salam, he picked up pebbles, small rocks, and he started throwing Shaitan with it. Why is it, is it shaitan physical? In this case, shaitan came to a physical form. And we have stories in the Quran as well that shaitan approaches a prophet of God in a physical form. That's possible. With us, again, that's not our opponent to be concerned about. Shaitan, again, oh, you know, the other day I saw shaitan. Please, again, do not compare yourself, you know, line to line with Ibrahim. Shaitan and our story is is temptation. With the Prophet of God, the more you have, the more iman you have, the greater is the challenge. The more you have, the more there's a challenge. You're a Prophet of God. 
Now we have to deal with shaitan in a physical form. And we have that Ibrahim threw those seven pebbles at him. And he came back. Second time he did it. And then the third time he did it. And that become what did we today as hujjaj, the pilgrims, when they go to hajj, they throw those pebbles at those pillars. Used to be pillars, now they made them walls and wider. They used to be pillars as a symbol of shaitan. As following the tradition of Ibrahim. This is the sunnah of Ibrahim, the way of Ibrahim. And we throw seven pebbles at the first one, the second one, the third one. And once he pushed aside shaitan, he, they, he get to the promise or the designated place for the sacrifice. He placed his child on the ground. And again, the hadith said, not the Quran. It said, Ismail told him, on oh, my father. Number one, tie my hand. I don't want my moving to distract you. This is Ismail telling him. Number two, take off my shirt. I don't want my mother, if, he, if she asks for my shirt, to see bloody shirt. Take off my shirt. And the third one is that, again, make sure the knife is sharp so you don't have to go through this and suffer. Not because of me, because of yourself. And we have that Ibrahim began the sacrifice. But no matter how many times he moved that knife in the throat of Ismail, it didn't work. The same way fire did not burn Ibrahim salam, the sharpness of the knife of Ibrahim did not cut the throat of Ismail. And this is when Allah said to Ibrahim, no need to continue, stop. That qad saddaqta roya, you fulfilled it. You told, you, you did what we told you, no need to sacrifice your son. And as you know, Allah doesn't change his mind. This is not about changing. Allah is not like us to change his mind. Allah has a plan. And this plan has a steps. And Allah said, you did it. The plan was for you to get here, and you got here. Inna kathalika najzil muhsineen. This is how we reward the virtuous, those who are doing good. Inna hadha lahu al-bala'ul mubin. This was indeed a manifest test. Then we ransomed him with a great sacrifice. That Allah says that we are going to replace the sacrifice with another one. And in the hadith said that it was a ram or it was a sheep that Allah sent to become a sacrifice. And that become a day of Eid al-Adha. Now people on the day of Eid al-Adha to follow the sunnah of Ibrahim. They sacrifice. The hujjaj is a requirement when you go to hajj. is wajib, an obligation to do it. For the non-hujjaj is mustahab, is recommended to do qurbani on the day of Eid al-Adha. There are more to about this, inshallah, we will conclude tomorrow night. What was the main messages of this story? Number one, dreams. Not to overcomplicate it, not to take it more than what it is. Number two, which is very critical, do not look at this story as a story that I should replicate. It's not about, oh, I had a dream, I should do this. Allah doesn't communicate to us that way. Allah communicates to us through Quran, through Prophet, through Ahlul Bayt. So you don't need to receive revelation in your dreams. No, you already have everything you need. Your dreams are just affirmation. Your dreams could be affirmation or warnings. That's it. They're not going to give you additional rules. And also reflect on the message of Quran. That Quran is not about that. When we look at these stories, it's not something to say, okay, I should do this. This is a very naive way, way, way of looking at Quran. So this is what Allah said, I should do this. For example, Ibrahim smashed idols, I should go and smash idols. Ibrahim, this is not it. That's the missing of, of proper tadabbur. And we should put our hand in the hand of Prophet and his family. And our scholars and ulama, our mufassirin of Qur'an did that. There's so many narrations out there. Some narrations, they contradict each other. Some narrations, they undermine one another. You need an expert to tell you, this is how we go. This is how we reconciliate. This is how we move forward. Otherwise, to just say, you know, this is what Allah says. And this is what I understood from it, and that's it. That's a very, very naive way of looking at the understanding of Qur'an. That's why, أَثْفَلَا يَتَدَّبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَخْفَانَا 
The Quran should be reflected properly. And the final point is the importance of relationship with our children, to communicate with them. To know that different age requires different approach. You could be friendly with them, but you cannot be a friend. You cannot be a culprit in crime with your child. Let's do it together. Let's do this wrong together. As friends, sometimes they do. They have each other's back, even if they do wrong. You cannot say, I'm friend with my daughter or son when they do wrong. That's what makes you a father. That's what makes you a mother. You want the trust to be there. You want the respect to be there. You want to be the kindness to be there. But at the same time, you want them to know that there's someone who's going to help them grow. You're not going to be a bystander watching them destroying themselves. If it's necessary, a father and a mother will say the bitter truth to you to their children. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the tawfiq of learning from the story of Ibrahim to raise families and children who are on the right path. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the tawfiq of hajj. Especially when we talk about wajib hajj. Allahumma zughni hajj baytikal haram. How important it is, the hajj, that in month of Ramadan, one of the du'as is recommended to be recited after every salat was Allahumma zughni hajj baytikal haram. Fi ami hadha wa fi kulla. May Allah grant us the tawfiq of performing pilgrimage and hajj. Especially wajib hajj. Because the, any mustahab, you do 20 umrah, is not going to replace wajib hajj. You do 20 ziyara, is not going to replace wajib hajj. Each of them have their own significance. May Allah give us that tawfiq. And may Allah make the hajj to be easy as they've been complicated for the past few years for all those who are intending to perform hajj, inshallah. For the soul of all marhumin, for the shifa and cure and healing of all those who are sick, those who ask us to pray for them, may Allah grant them immediate relief. Recite Surah Fatiha with the salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. A family of Latif, they did Khatm al-Quran. They asked me to recite the Dua Khatm al-Quran. I'll quickly recite the Dua Khatm al-Quran for the completion of this Quran. Sadaq Allahu al-Aliyu al-Azim wa sadaq Rasuluhu al-Nabiyu al-Ameenu al-Kareem wa nahnu ala thalika min al-Shahideen wa al-Shakirin wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Allahumma nawwir qulubana bitalawat al-Quran wa zayyin akhlaqana bizinat al-Quran wa ashfi mardana wa amradana bil-Quran. Allahumma gfir warham mawtana bil-Quran. اللهم انصر الإسلام والمسلمين بالقرآن واخذ الكفار والمنافقين بالقرآن اللهم اجعل القرآن في الدنيا قرينا وفي القبر مونسا وأنيسا وعلى صراط نورا ودليلا وفي القيامة شافعا وشفيعا اللهم اغفر المؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منه الأنباد بالأخص مرحومين المغفورين المنظورين رحم الله لمن قرأ الفاتح مع الصلوات وعجل اللهم في فرج مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان السلام عليك يا رسول الله يا نبي الله يا خير خلق الله يا خاتم النبيين السلام عليك يا أمير المؤمنين ويا إمام المتقين علي بن أبي طالب السلام عليك يا فاطمة الزهراء سيدة نساء العالمين السلام عليكم أي الحسن والحسين سبط نبي الرحمة وسيد شباب أهل الجنة أجمعين السلام على علي بن الحسين زين العابدين السلام على محمد بن علي الباقر السلام على جعفر بن محمد الصادق السلام على موسى بن جعفر الكاظم السلام على علي بن موسى الرضا السلام على محمد بن علي التقي الجواد السلام على علي بن محمد الهاد النقي السلام على حسن بن علي العسكري الزكي السلام عليك يا صاحب الزمان يا خليفة الرحمن يا إمام الإنس والجان السلام عليكم يا أهل بيت النبوة ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا أنزلناه في ليلة القدر وما أدراك ما ليلة القدر ليلة القدر خير من ألف شهر 
تنزل الملائكة والروح فيها بإذن ربهم من كل أمر سلام هي حتى مطلع الفجر صدق الله العلي العظيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين